the second phase of our introduction to what I call groupthink, thinking in the ways that we're going to need to think in abstract algebra, is going to see us explore the symmetries of regular polygons. So by definition, symmetry of a polygon is something that I can do to that polygon that will result in the polygon laying in the same spot on the xy plane at the end as when we started. So just as an example, if I have a regular pentagon, so a five-sided polygon whose sides all have the same length, then one example of a symmetry that I could apply to it is just to take the whole polygon and rotate it 72 degrees uh, to the counterclockwise direction, right? Um, that's going to leave my polygon in the same spot, but I've kind of done something. I've turned it a little bit, a fifth of a, of a turn. Um, another thing I might be able to do to that pentagon is to take it and just flip it about one of its axes of symmetry, right? So those are all examples of symmetries I can apply to a polygon. And so the question is, how many kinds of symmetries are there, and how can we describe them and the ways that they interact with one another as an algebraic structure? In what sense are symmetries not geometry, but algebra? And what we can do, it turns out, is to break it down into two types of symmetry that we can sort of focus in on. One type is a symmetry that involves a reflection. The other is a symmetry that involves a rotation. And what we'll do is define that rotation, rotation by 360 divided by n degrees, where n is the number of sides in the polygon. We're going to call that symmetry operation R. And a reflection about a fixed axis, we're going to call that T. So as an example, the symmetry that we could get by doing R followed by T followed by R is a rotation followed by a reflection followed by another rotation. And any time I take two different symmetries and I glue them together doing one followed by the other, that result, that combination, is going to be a new symmetry of my polygon. So RTR is what's being visualized here on the screen right now. Rotate and then reflect and then rotate. So if you follow it here, R followed by T followed by R. So we're living in a new world now where we have a T and we have an R that both mean something in our universe. They're not the same as the T and R that we saw when we were working with rational tangles, but there might be some tenuous connections and some important differences. So those are the questions that we want to explore now. What can we say about the T and the R, which we now have in these groups of symmetries, which we call in abstract algebra dihedral groups? A little fancy lingo for you. So for example, we saw in the world of rational tangles that the inverse of R was the same thing as R repeated three times. Right? And that was the case because for our rational tangles, if we were to rotate our tangle four times, we would get back to where we started. And that may be true if our figure that we're rotating is a square. Right? Four rotations, one, two, three, four, takes us exactly back to where we began. But if our figure was something else, let's say it was a hexagon or an octagon, if I take this octagon and I rotate it four times, one, two, three, four, now I don't have my original figure back anymore. Um, so clearly there's something there that's a little bit different compared to the world of rational tangles. It's much the same for the square, but it's different for any other value of n, any other different polygon that we might work with. Um, the other thing that we saw was that for rational tangles, if we started with a T, if we started with a twist, here I'm going to start with a, a reflection, because that's what T means now, that we could undo that T by using the inverse element R, T, R, T, R. And evidently, at least in the case of the triangle, that doesn't seem to work here anymore. So the inverse of T in this particular structure is no longer R, T, R, T, R. Um, at least not for the triangle. We could try it for some other figures and see if it works, but I think we'll find the same thing. T followed by R, T, R, T, R does not, in fact, get us back to the original configuration. So there's some fundamental difference that's going on here. So in our class, we played around with this tool, which, by the way, those of you watching in Internet land, you can access this tool uh, through my website, Head up mathematics.com slash abstract, and you can find this tool in the first chapter in the section called The Tale of T and R. Uh, this little tool here was built in the online platform called Scratch. It's a great programming environment. Um, you can use it to do a whole ton of things and doesn't have a, a ton of learning curve. So Scratch is really, really cool. Um, 
But you can play around with this and get a sense with how, of how T's and R's interact with one another. And you all had some conjectures uh, at the end of class to make, and I want to give you a couple of challenges for things to think about uh, before our next class. Conjecture number one that you came up with is that we can get back to the original, you know, in other words, we can make a, a combination of symmetries that lead to no change in two different ways. We can do TR, TR, or we can do RT, RT. The conjecture is that both of those are equal to the identity. They're equal to, to no change at all. They get you back to the original figure. And that that's true for every value of n, for every regular polygon that we could try it with. So if we try it out on this pentagon, for example, t r t r does in fact get this pentagon back to its original position. r t r t also gets this pentagon back to its original position. And the conjecture that the group made was that that also will hold for every one of these regular polygons. Octagon, T, R, T, R, gets us back to home base. R, T, R, T, also gets us back to home base. So, so far, it seems like that conjecture is borne out by the initial evidence. Of course, that doesn't make us proof, but that at least gives us a place to start. That also tells us something about the inverses of T and R. Because R, T, R cancels T, and T, R, T cancels R, the prediction there is that therefore T inverse, the left, the two-sided inverse of T is R T R, and the two-sided inverse of R is T R T. Again, because these combinations equal the identity. Another conjecture, at least an observation, is that there's something about this environment which is simpler than rational tangles. Because tangles can get really super duper complicated. They can get as complicated as you want to make them. But somehow polygons, there's only so many things that we can do to make a symmetry of a regular polygon. So somehow this is a smaller universe than the one that we lived in with tangles. Another observation that your groups made is that in addition to RTR being an inverse for the reflection T, T itself is also a reflection of its own self. Why? Well, it's like looking at an image of yourself in the mirror in the mirror. Right? If I take this octagon, for example, and I reflect it once, now I have the opposite. But if I reflect that one more time across the same axis, I end up exactly back where I started. In fact, there's a whole mathematical theory of what are called reflections, and reflections are defined by this very characteristic, that it's the kind of operation which when you do it twice, you always end up originally back where you started. We could also make a conjecture about the inverse of rotations, which we'll do here in a minute. It also seems like every time we do a reflection, every time we do a T in here, that it's like passing through the looking glass and all of our orientations change. So that if I rotate after doing a reflection, then the net effect of that rotation is no longer going to be counterclockwise, it's going to be clockwise, or at least it's going to be in the opposite orientation to the orientations that reflections had before that T was encountered. And for that reason, we also made the prediction that the inverse of R in this environment is just N minus 1 repetitions of R. How do I undo a rotation? I just have to keep doing the same rotation uh, one less times than the number of sides in the polygon. So for example, for this octagon, if I rotate once, and then I want to know how do I get back to home again, well I just need to keep rotating. I rotated once for this octagon, I need to rotate seven more times before I get back home. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's not surprising, I think, uh, at all uh, for what we should expect from these rotations. After all, if I rotate n times, each rotation being 360 over n degrees, then doing that n times is going to give me a 360 degree rotation, which is the same as no rotation at all. So r to the n minus 1 is indeed the inverse of r. And in the same way, we can also think of the equation t inverse equals t. t is its own inverse. It's another way to say that t to the second power is the identity. A reflection of a reflection means that we haven't done anything at all. So this is the beginning of our study of abstract algebra, because we're now thinking about some really good questions about, OK, I've got these objects, I've got these nouns in my universe, my t's and my r's, and I have this verb, the, the operation that puts together t's and r's and follows one symmetry with another, or follows one rational tangle dance with another, right? So we have nouns and we have verbs, and then the questions that we're asking are, how do these nouns interact with one another? 
what properties does this verb have when it acts on those nouns? Um, so to, to kind of extend this out, the next steps in helping to understand this structure are go and, and make a symmetry, a complicated symmetry uh, using this tool, and then try and rewrite that same symmetry, discover that same symmetry expressed in two different ways. One way where we put all the T's first and then the R's, and the other where we put all the R's first before the T's. So for example, let's say that I'm going to come in and use a hexagon, and let me do a symmetry where I do some R's first and then I do some T's after. So maybe R, 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 T. So there's a symmetry. So then the question would be, how do I do this same symmetry by doing T's first instead of R's? So this is R, 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 T. If I want to get to that same thing, I would have to do T and then some number of R's. Right? So see if you can come up with a conjecture that relates those two things together. If I do all of my T's first and then my R's versus all of my R's first and then my T's, how are those two expressions going to be related uh, for the same symmetry?